todos. Olá, boa noite a todos. Estamos aqui para mais uma palestra do ciclo internacional de palestras de, de literatura, estética e filosofia social. Então, eu gostaria de agradecer ao Vitor Sei, que está cuidando da transmissão nos bastidores, e também gostaria de agradecer a professora Catherine Birhammer, que está aqui conosco, que leciona na Universidade de Alberta, e também a professora Júnia Zaidan, que está aqui me ajudando a mediar a palestra da professora Ketchum. Então, hoje nós vamos é, apresentar a professora, a Júnia vai apresentar, depois nós temos a palestra da Ketchum, e depois nós vamos abrir para uma sessão de perguntas. E se vocês quiserem perguntar, gente, em português mesmo, depois nós podemos fazer a tradução, ok? Então, bom, vou falar em inglês agora. Hello everyone, good evening. I am Luciana Molina and I'm here with Professor Catherine Binhammer from University of Alberta and Professor Junior Zaidan from Universidade Federal do Espírito Santo. Professor Catherine Binhammer is going to give her lecture The Novelization of Money, Capitalism and Literary Form. Before her talk, Junior is going to introduce her and after her talk, we are going to have a session of questions and answers. Thank you so much, Catherine Junior, to come here to talk to us. Tonight. Então, a palavra para a Júnior. Muito obrigada, Luciana. Boa noite para você, boa noite para o Vitor. E good evening, Catherine. We much appreciate your accepting the invitation. Estamos aqui, então, é, com muita alegria para contribuir aí com a mediação. É, eu apresento, portanto, a Catherine em, em português. I'll introduce Catherine in Portuguese first, and then we do it in English. A professora Catherine Binhammer leciona a literatura britânica do século XVIII, estudos feministas e teoria da narrativa no Departamento de Inglês e Estudos Audiovisuais da Universidade de Alberta, no Canadá. Seu livro sobre estudos financeiros, críticos e a história do romance, intitulado Downward Mobility, The Form of Capital and the Sentimental Novel, foi publicado pela John Hopkins University Press em 2020. A Catherine também publicou o livro The Seduction Narrative in Britain, é, 1747-1800, pela Cambridge University Press, em 2000, e ensaios em periódicos e coletâneas como, por exemplo, The Cam Cambridge Companion to Women's Writing in Britain, Narrative Feminist Studies, GLQ, Women's Studies, ELA, 18th Century Fiction, Studies in the Novel and the Journal of the History of Sexuality. Então, é tendo apresentado a professora Catherine, cuja palestra é, já é, mencionada pela Luciana. É, em português, a gente faz agora isso em in inglês para eventuais é, participantes que tenham atendido a divulgação que foi feita de que será em in inglês. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to what I know will be a fascinating talk by Professor Catherine Benhammer on the novelization of money, capitalism and literary form. Professor Catherine Binhammer teaches 18th century British literature, feminist studies and narrative theory in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta. Her book on critical finance studies and the history of the novel, Downward Mobility, the Forum of Capital and the Sentimental Novel, was published by John Hopkins University Press in 2020. She has also published The Seduction Narrative in Britain, uh, Cambridge 2009, I actually mentioned 2000, but it was, uh, let me just correct that. And essays mm -hmm. in venues such as the Cambridge Companion to Women's Writing in Britain, 1660-1789, Narrative, Family Studies, GLQ, Women's Studies, ELA, 18th Century Fiction, Studies in the Novel and the Journal of the History of Sexuality. We are very glad to have you, Professor Catherine, with us. Estamos muito felizes. É, repito, né? reitero, I'd like to reinforce to everyone who is watching, uh, quem, quem quiser colocar suas perguntas em português, if you'd like to write your answers in which, whatever language, you, I mean, English or Portuguese, actually, these are the languages available at the moment, a gente vai tentar fazer mediação linguística aqui, we hope uh, everything turns out fine, and I'm sure it will. Thank you, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'd like to begin by first thanking the organizers, Luciana and, and Junia, for, for inviting me. It's, it's a real privilege um, to be here and where is here. 
And here um, where I am in Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada, um, we have a tradition of acknowledging that we are speaking on Indigenous land, the mm -hmm. land of the First Nations peoples. So I'd like to begin just by acknowledging that I myself am on Treaty 6 land, the home of the Papachase Cree. And you um, um, are, are have, I'm sure, have a similar kind of um, um, way of acknowledging. Um, so my talk today is going to be from the book. It's sort of an overview of the book for those who came for 18th century British literature. Um, there will be little. I've left out um, that part and tried to to talk on a more general philosophical level of the, the aims of the book. Um, now, uh, Luciano, do you have the, the PowerPoint? Yeah. And could we, yeah, put that there, great. And, and so, um, yes, Luciana has the, has the control, so I'm going to be telling her when to, to move it forward. Okay, if Capital were a novel, what story would it tell? The story has often been imagined as an adventure tale, like this famous one of a young British hero who sets off across the Atlantic Ocean with a ship full of goods, risking his life on a quest for riches and happiness. The climax comes when the risks pay off and he sells his cotton for profit, bringing wealth to the nation. Slide. Just move it forward. If we were read, to read Adam Smith's famous Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, um, as a novel, this would be its story. Events in the, in the novel are sequenced in such a way that the merchant's investments are linked through causality to the rising wealth. So global commerce and technological innovation are imagined as the source of infinite wealth. The belief that economic growth can be unlimited is, of course, the great story of the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment progress narrative, one that we remain entangled in today. We see it, for instance, in the World Bank's classification of countries, which is built on a fantastical temporality of economic growth, in which we have Canada, a developed nation, Brazil, a developing nation, and Haiti as the least developed. The tenses in those verbs suggest a temporality of infinite growth. So economic historians today place the beginning of Britain's constant economic growth registered as an annual increasing gross national product in the late 18th century. Um, and, and this growth has continued uh, um, except for wars and recessions until today. An aggregate increase um, in wealth in the West, we know, came at the cost of colonial violence and also um, that, that aggregate wealth for Britain did not circulate evenly among British citizens. Um, so more wealth for all does not translate, sorry, more wealth does not translate into more wealth for all. Um, but I want to set aside material history in this lecture. Um, my interest lies in cultural history in the cultural assumption that growth is continuous, desirable, and natural, an assumption whose genealogy we can trace to the late 18th century. Slide. As Anthony Brewer notes, the idea that capitalist economies normally grow over time was a major change of perspective, part of a wider change in which people cease to think of past, present, and future as essentially alike. That is to say that economic growth to happen had to change the way people thought about time. So culture's role in shaping this new attitude to time in which the future was imagined not only as different, but better, richer, wealthier, um, is what this lecture is trying to think about. So the story Adam Smith tells in Wealth of Nations of capitalism bringing wealth to all is, of course, not the only story, um, not the only new form of stories in the 18th century. 
the great literary historical event of the rise of the novel corresponds with Smith. Slide. Um, Scholars of the rise of the novel often assume a link between the progress narrative of mercantile capitalism and the upward mobility plot, um, paradigmatically in, illustrated by Robinson Crusoe, who has who links Brazil um, um, and and Europe. Um, but when we turn to fiction in the second, so 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 the history of the novel always thinks about Robinson Crusoe as this upward mobility tale, right? Like Robinson, through his own hard work, um, becomes wealthy. Um, but in fact, when we turn to the second half of the 18th century, what we see are story after story of economic loss, of financial disasters, um, um, of people losing everything. And my book reads these stories of loss and, and thinks about why at this moment in the history of economic growth, do all of a sudden we have all these stories of teary-eyed um, um, heroines suffering financial distress. And I argue, um, slide, um, that, that, um, um, that downward mobility is as important a myth in the literary and economic history of capitalism as is upward mobility. Um, and that financial failure performs a crucial structural role in the cultural history of economic growth. Um, but for today, I'm going to largely leave the 18th century novel behind and introduce you to the project's larger theoretical and historical claims, specifically what I call the novelization of money as capital. I first outline the relationship between the novelization of money and financialization, before thinking about how the novel's temporal dynamic allows it to plot the contradictions of capitalism. And because I'm a literary critic, I'm gonna to turn to a short reading of a novel, a contemporary novel at the end. Okay, slide, let's see. Um, and then actually just hit it twice, the slide twice. Thanks. Okay, so, so the main argument of this lecture is that the form of capital and the form of the novel are homologous. Ho there's a homology, um, which means that they share a central structure. So if capital, and, and, then, and then secondly, following from that claim, um, slide, is that if capital were a literary text, its form um, would be narrative, not poetry. And further, that the narrative form best suited to capturing the dynamic circulations of capital, um, its way of making sense of the world, is the novel. The novel's complex temporality, its interpretive webs, its play of probability and risk, um, aligns with capital's form. Um, another critic, Joshua Clover, has argued that poetry, with its speculative abstractions, is the form of late capital. But I disagree. Um, I read into the novel the structure of capital's narrative, not capital's history. Um, and doing so allows me to posit the novelization of money um, slide. So the term novelization comes from Michael Bakhtin, um, and uh, particularly from the dialogic imagination. Uh, Bakhtin analyzes the novel's rise and traces its, quote, novelization of other genres or the way its dialogism and heteroglossia embeds itself in other forms um, and, and through multiple voices. Um, so that's his argument that the novel takes all these other genres and turns it into um, this diversity of voices. Um, and what I want to argue through an analogously, capital's rise can be traced in its novelization of money. Um, slide, I think. Um, yes, and that uh, um, the way that the novel, that sorry, the way it takes over money to give it narrative form. So capital takes over money, it novelizes money, um, to give it a narrative form because capital requires time, whereas money doesn't necessarily. Money can act as a symbol. So I read novels for what they might tell us about the modes of understanding necessitated 
by financialization at any given historical period. As capital shifts, so does the novel's form. Okay, so my interest in narrative and economic growth began with a question. Why, when our current environmental crisis has shown us that the world's resources are finite, when the refugee crisis has laid bare structural global inequalities of wealth, why do we continue to organize our economies around economic growth? This narrative is fraying, and of course the narrative has always already been frayed in non-European context. Progress didn't arrive for indigenous populations in Canada. Whether or not we see that there is an actual end to Western upward mobility, um, or whether or not the pandemic will reveal, for instance, that we are in fact at the end of capitalism is not the main question that concerns me now, though it is a crucial question and one that Luciana has written on and has a lot to, to say about, I know. Um, what interests me here is that despite knowing otherwise, despite all the scientific evidence for climate change, for growing inequalities, our culture remains caught in this narrative that we can all be wealthier and we can all have more. So given this, my, my, my suggestion and many other suggestions is the story itself is the problem. Um, that um, um, it's what's stopping us from, from imagining, imagining and thinking of ways to distribute wealth and education more equitably. Slide. Okay, so why I'm arguing um, that the novel and not political economy is the narrative form where capital most thrives is because unlike political economy, the novel's heteroglossia, its diversity of voices, um, is able to capture capital's contradictions. There's, there's narrative space, both in order to manage them on the one hand, but also, as with the novel I'm going to turn to at the end, in order to think outside um, um, them, in order to offer ways of, of pushing back against them. Um, so I want to first give you an example from um, political economy for why, why fictional narratives might be better than political economy narratives um, in, in, in doing this. Um, okay, and, and it comes from a chapter uh, from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations on the origin and use of money. So it's, it's how Smith tells the story of where money comes from. Where does money, what's the origins of money? He, call, he, he describes it as evolving naturally out of barter to solve what economists call the problem of the double coincidence of wants. Um, slide. So once upon a time, um, once upon a time, there was a butcher who needed more meat than he could consume. And at the same time, there was a baker who had more bread. And so um, um, they wanted to exchange one for the other. Enter money as the medium of exchange to solve the problem of finding a seller of meat who wants bread just when the bread seller is looking for beef. So that's Smith's idea of where money comes from. Here, money provides the liquid for the flow of commerce, allowing commodities to circulate. Now, this origin story is, of money is told and retold throughout economic history. Um, the image that's in front of you comes from um, the website in Investopedia, which is the Wikipedia for finance. Um, and, uh, and the video that it shows tells the story. It's the story of the origin of money. But this oft-told tale is actually misguided. Um, and uh, um, slide um, a point that radical anthropologist David Graeber um, brilliantly lays out in his book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. Um, he argues that this origin story for money is a fallacy. It's never happened. That in fact, we did not begin with barter discover money, and then eventually develop credit systems, it precisely happened the other way around. That is, we began with credit system, with what we owed each other, and then developed actual uh, money. Um, so, so why it matters, whether the origin story of money lies in debt rather than barter, is significant for our understanding of how capital works. 
So Smith's narrative about the triumph of commerce and the origins of money is full of plot holes and blind spots, and which are now fairly obvious to us. Colonial violence, slavery, racism. Um, but one of the biggest plot holes of Smith's reciprocal gain theory is that it imagines trade as an equal exchange of use values. Um, my cotton for your sugar, my bread for your uh, um, uh, uh, meat. And for this reason, is unable to account for the way that wealth actually expands under capitalism by exchanging money for money, not cotton for sugar. Um, in a speculative market system, anything, including cotton, can be turned into a financial instrument. So wealth of nations can't narrate the way money works as capital, mostly because it's unable to capture this fundamental contradiction of use value versus exchange value um, slide. Uh, and, and some of you might be familiar with this uh, from Marx's famous chapter on the general formula for capital laid out uh, the contradiction between these things. Between commodity exchange, the first, the top one, CMC, where you know you exchange one commodity with money to buy another commodity. Um, that's a theory of exchange based on use value. Um, it's a theory of value founded in equivalence, in which money functions like a metaphor, one thing replacing another, um, through a logic of substitution. Capitalism, however, is about the second kind of exchange. Um, the, the exchange of money for a commodity to make more money, to, to you know, profit from it. This exchange has an extended story. Um, it has a repetition and a sequencing of events where money is invested, stores value, then produces more value later when it's sold at a higher price, and then the story repeats and begins again. So the logic of the second exchange is one of infinite accumulation. Um, and this is why um, David Harvey, following Marx, thinks about capital as a process um, rather than as a thing. And why I argue metonymy rather than metaphor, um, the trope of continuity, continuity and sequence rather than metaphor better captures capital's temporality. Um, slide, I think. Um, so yeah, this gives you a, a sort of general sense of how I'm thinking about the difference between these two different exchanges and why narrative um, is the better one. Okay, so asking where the more of growth comes from leads us to what is called within critical finance studies, financialization. Um, and and um, let's do this another slide. Yeah. And financialization um, uh, is the increase in centrality of financial markets within our economy. Um, that is the growing amount of profits generated from buying and selling debt or um, packaged as financial services and products, um, including the ever increasingly sophisticated um, financial instruments that led to the 2008 um, uh, uh, crash, the endless derivatives that package and repackage risk and time, often through computer algorithms. This form of capital circulation, where money seeks out quicker and more abstract ways of making money, results in the cyclical tendency of capital to free um, uh, the money, commodity, money exchange from the commodity and become fictitious capital. Um, Luciana, I think, slide. Um, so today, these abstractions have reached a real level of complex complexity that often only Wall Street mathematicians or the quants are able to kind of figure out. Um, but while the math might be complex, the form of money breeding money is not. They're just various versions of that. Um, and the pandemic has really revealed how far apart fictitious capital is from material production. So all material production, you know, ceased with the with the coronavirus, but yet stocks have never made as much money. So there's a big, you know, separation break between those two. 
So turning debt into a financial instrument produces the more of economic growth, and it allows debt to become increasingly detached from the social relation of the original risk. David Graeber's argument about the history of money helps us understand the way money's novelization as capital requires a different origin story, one that captures the asymmetrical relations between debtors and creditors. So to think about credit as coming after money, simply to grease the wheels of commerce, erases how debt is dislodged from social context. Debts are what we owe each other. Um, and, and these become anonymized in financial exchanges. When debt becomes simply a matter of numbers um, erased from its original risks, the real cost of that, of that risk is never paid. Um, it allows creditors to become strangers to what they owe. Um, and we see this, I was trying to look at an example and I, and I came across um, a, a series of Canadian mining companies um, that, are, were, that held investments in uh, the, the Brumagino uh, dam disaster. So they contributed, countries from my country contributed to the disaster close to you that killed hundreds of people, but they don't pay anything for taking that risk, right? So um, uh, slide, as many recent critics such as um, Maurizio Lazzarato and Susan Sodenberg suggest, class divisions in our contemporary moment of financialization have been rewritten from those between capitalists and workers to those between creditors and debtors, those with equity and those without. Um, okay, so how do we find our way out of the, you can, do, you can keep that, yeah, sure. How do we find our way out of our addiction to economic growth? I argue that we need a redefinition of our cultural understanding um, of time as monumental as the one that occurred in the 18th century, and that narrative can help us do this. We've all probably heard the saying, Luciana, um, it is easier, slide, sorry, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. The phrase points to what Mark Fisher described um, as capitalist realist, or the widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible to imagine a coherent alternative to it. Um, so an effect of capitalist ideology is a creation of this imaginative vortex that traps us inside its logic. And I argue that narrative, that complex mode of human understanding that, that is fundamental to the way we make meaning can be put to use to counter this understanding. So the frustration we experience with the rise of populism, with fake news, is merely a symptom of a cultural logic that refuses the slow, complicated work of interpretation. Slide. In his research, um, on the cultures of financialization, uh, Max Haven explicitly opposes fictitious capital to narrative, arguing that, quote, financialization is both a cause and a consequence of a broader shift away from narrative and towards metaphor. Financialization forces us to contend with a fragmentary world where narratives no longer seem to hold and where our shared understandings of social and economic processes are increasingly disjunction and chaotic, the extremism of today. That, that's why, to me, it's important to insist upon and develop skills to excel at understanding narrative. So how does narrative then offer us a way to imagine the outside of financialization? I say the, that narrative's plotting, that the plot is key. The homology between the form of capital and the form of the novel is, um, is most evident in the way that both structure time. Both configure temporality through a non-chronological plotting that allows irresolvable times to coexist. So before we get to the plot in the novel, I wanna begin with an advertisement from a wealth management branch of Morgan Stanley 
slide. So Morgan Stanley is one of the biggest financial, oh, another slide. There, thank you. Um, so Morgan Stanley is one of the biggest financial investment companies on Wall Street. Um, and this advertisement explicitly points to plot um, uh, in, in its title. This is the four generations of plot twists. Um, what's their Morgan Stanley's investment in plots? In the ad, they promise to help you, quote, create a wealth plan that reflects all the complexity of a modern family by starting with a financial advisor who understands individuals. Understanding individuals is, of course, the great promise of the novel, as well as Morgan Stanley, that narrating the particular lives of fictional individuals um, provides insight. The ad helps us see, however, the temporal contradiction of capital in what I call its existential problem. When the plot of infinite growth is individualized and desacralized, as it is in the novel and in Capital, I, as a self-realizing subject, I as individual, um, in, 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 um, in this moment of the I, material life or death presents the ultimate limit, the final closure, that which cannot be overcome. There's no infinite growth um, um, to the individual's life, right? We die. Um, why accumulate more capital if you can't take it with you? As the saying goes in Canada, if we have the saying in English, you can't take it with you. Um, well, so capital accumulation is always future oriented. Uh, most investment ads, um, slide, uh, most investment ads prey upon the anxiety about the future. Um, here's just a few of them about dreams, about futures. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an anxiety about the future that, that uh, will come to an end. Um, the ad and, and much 19th century realist fiction plots the answer to the question of, you know, what you can't take it with you, why accumulate more then as your family. So inheritance, being able to have something to pass on to your family, um, there, therefore the four generations of plot twists, um, I think slide, uh, um, that that is, is um, uh, the reason why you invest. Uh, okay. So, uh, so then it's, it's about time. And so I want to think about the time of capital. What is capital's plot? How would we plot that? Um, what temporality would we use? Um, well, the temporality is far from unitary or teleological. Um, there, there's multiple temporalities. It's not a simple sequence of upward mobility. Um, Capitalist narrative requires, I argue, at least four different temporal modalities to manage its contradictions. Um, and I think of these modalities in relation to Paul Ricoeur's, um, the, the, the famous philosopher of time and narrative, um, his notion of non-chronological temporality. So we have, we have this happens next, this happens next, this happens next, the chronological, but then the way novels map time to make things feel differently is the non-chronological temporality. So the first slide, and there's gonna be four, and at every, every one, um, uh, we need a new slide. Okay, the first temporality is adventure time. Um, the time of risk and speculation. Um, this is the time of the spontaneous, the coincidental, the accidental. Um, adventure time involves the individualized carpe diem where anyone can get rich at any time. Um, uh, it requires us to live in history as if it is for the first time that this time is going to be different. This time it's going to pay off. Um, it's the time of speculation, danger, suspense. Okay. Then we have the, the second one. It's already up. It's linear time. Um, novels also require, um, more than risk, right? They demand that time accumulates and progresses such that its passage is linear. Um, it signifies growing wealth along with the turning of the page. Um, so linear time um, is, is something that E.P. Thompson wonderfully analyzed in his classic essay, Time, Work, Discipline, and Industrial Capitalism. Um, it's a linear temporal mode, sequences events through cause and effect. Um, so hard work 
leads to economic gain. Um, in, in the novel, this temporality is mapped through an individual's life, often as a coming of age story or Bildungsroman, as we say in, in, in English. The third temporality slide is the cyclical. Um, this, this is the, the time that charts the business cycle, the boom and bust of oil, of mine, of gold, um, um, the endless repetition of expansion, stagnation, recession, of oil prices going up and down. So a cyclical temporality requires both a forgetting of the past, that there was once a bust, um, and, and an erasure of the future. It's just a kind of now. Um, in the novel, cyclical time is often represented through a temporality of fashion, um, a, a repetition of consumption, of novelty. And lastly, capital also requires in its plot the infinite time. Um, this is the economic growth time. Um, there is no time, um, um, it's kind of outside time in the constant circulation. Um, this is the time where no future possibility is ever foreclosed, where the entire world can have a Western standard of living, that technology will save us from climate change. Um, in the novel, as in the Morgan Stanley ad, the infinite more of economic growth is registered in the novel as reproduction, inheritance, um, tradition. Um, and it's the temporality which seeks to obliterate death. Okay, so these multiple temporalities, um, as we can see in this brief overview, plot relations between events very differently. Um, and, and events plotted, say, within adventure time, for instance, often relate um, are related through coincidence, that suddenly time arrives. Robinson Crusoe is full of these coincidences where, you know, it just so happens that the Spanish um, um, captain arrives to save him. Um, my argument that narrative is, a, is the form of capital stems from the way the novel's temporal dialogism it's play between status and conflict, repetition and difference captures these multiple temporalities. It does throw, so through plots, how plots texture time in narrative, not through static chronologies of what happens next, but by understanding plot as an interpretive dynamic. And so I wanna say a few things about plot slide. So plot is one of the most basic categories um, of fiction. And for that reason, we mostly take it for granted um, uh, has having something to do with sequencing of events. Um, all stories require something to happen, um, but a plot or so common knowledge suggests requires a principle of order of unifying those events. And prior to post-structuralist narrative theory, that that order was often just thought to be chronology. But that's, but that's been questioned. Um, because if plots are understood only as ordered chronology, then, um, uh, then, that, then that doesn't really uh, address the interpretive pleasure we get in novels or their depth of meaning. Uh, Michael Levinson, uh, a narrative theorist, cites various examples of plot summaries um, from soap opera digest to cliff notes to schmoop on online, those plot summaries to demonstrate the paucity, um, the poverty of thinking about plot and narrative time simply as chronology of events, because they, they give it to you, but it doesn't actually let you experience the depth. Um, so post-structuralist narrative theory redefined plot away from chronology and towards thinking about it as a dynamic. Um, a process um, as not closed and fixed, but open, um, a sense-making operation or mental configuration. So plot as a dynamic between reader and text presumes that narrative has a historical component in that reader's activity of embedding parts into holes um, will always involve horizons of the possible within a represented worldview. And so a dynamic of meaning making involves the reader's anticipation of what might come next. Um, and, and this dynamic then involves the reader in what Paul Ricoeur um, slide, um, Paul Ricoeur describes as a configural process, 
um, over ahead of ourselves. Just leave it. That's fine. Um, a process that works with an interplay between chronological and non-chronological time, between the episodic dimension, um, which characterized the story as made out of events, and the configural dimension, according to which plot construes significant holes out of, uh, out of scattered events. So in a longer version of this talk, I show, I look at four novels from four different historical periods and, and show their specific temporal configuration registers the historical specificity of capital at that time. Um, so in Daniel Defoe, we have a moment of imperial expansion where adventure time is mapped in terms of linear. Um, I look at Francis Burney in the, in the late 18th century, which was um, a time of risk management, of needing of speculative capital, needing in, um, um, uh, to, to manage risk through insurance. Um, and her novel is as, as having a temporality that, that brings us to that. Um, and, and so I'm going to use as my example today, however, the last one from the 21st century, a contemporary American novel to illustrate my claims about narrative and capital's temporality. And that's um, Chris Krause's Summer of Hate slide. Um, uh, Chris Krause's Summer of Hate, which was published in 2012. Some of you might, if you if you watch American TV, might know Kraus from um, I Love Dick, which is a great title uh, for uh, a novel and a television show. It was recently turned into a into a, a TV show. Um, her, but her later novel, Summer of Hate, is the one I'm going to concentrate on today. It's what we call autofiction. Um, in, in the 21st century of capital, the fictionalized self is the self. Um, and Kat, um, Krauss's alter ego, is always already a performative identity. Slide. Um, the relentlessly self-reflexive, um, okay, yeah, that's fine. The relentlessly self-reflective narcissistic voice breaks through any mystifying plot with over-particularized material details of life. So I've read a lot of what I call financial crisis fiction um, in English. Um, so fiction post 2008 crisis. Um, and here's a list of, of, of tons of them. Um, and But most of these, I would argue, um, narrate debt and real estate ex speculation as moral satire. And they end up mystifying financial capitalism. Um, and mystifying it is about individual choice. These people could have acted differently. Um, and, and so because of that, they don't allow any fissures to appear within capitalist realism. And what I'm arguing is that Krauss does um, and that Summer of Hate is able to do that um, because of its particular way of, of, of narrating time. Um, it's hyperrealism manages to plot money in such a way that reveals the contradictions of capital. Uh, okay, slide. So, so now I'm just going to try, I'm just going to give you sort of an overview of the novel that I hope will kind of illustrate some of these points. Um, so the plot merges real estate speculation with the heroine Katz's search for meaning and the hero Paul's um, search for personal freedom. Um, it's told in interwoven chapters from Kat and Paul's point of view. Romance momentarily gives them both what they're looking for as Paul helps Kat renovate apartments she bought in the undertapped market in Albuquerque with the profits from selling assets in overpriced Los Angeles. So recirculating capital launches the novel and the love affair. Um, Kat, however, is not your typical capitalist. Like Krauss, she is an artist living on contract faculty wages, much wealthier and more privileged than Paul, and with a postmodern critical self-reflexivity that self-consciously tries to figure out the plot of George Bush's uh, America. Um, George Bush Jr.'s America, I should say. Kat is frustrated by postmodern skepticism and fragmentation that unintentionally has led to today's apathetic, everything is subjective. Um, and now what we would call the post-truth era. Doubt, 
She writes, the existential disease of the 20th century, Trump's narrative. And thus she is trying to place more faith in narrative, she says. So in the 21st century, there is no one grand narrative, like perhaps in Charles Dickens' Victorian novels, where everything you know, comes together and makes sense. But here, self-reflexiveness and doubt translates into a constant interrogation of everything. Um, and but this voice is not allowed to dominate. There's always a counter. It's a dialectical, you know, relation. It's coupled with Paul's voice, who's an ex-convict whose original crime was charging nine hundred and thirty-seven dollars to his employer's credit card um, uh, during an alcohol-induced joyride. So he made this one bad mistake, you know. But then the original nine hundred and thirty-seven dollars compounds. Um, and though he is free, the novel implots the way that his debt enslaves him, continues to enslave him after he gets out of jail. Um, so debt, not profit, accumulates. He pays $25 a week for parole and $120 a month for the breath saver on his car. So the interest and penalties in these defaulted loans, um, not to mention the loans themselves, makes Paul's life unaccountable. So the juxtaposition between the two individual plots reveals the asymmetrical differences between creditors and debtors, um, both financially and effectively. So the novel's 12 chapters follow the 12-step Alcoholic Anonymous program, which suggests a potential future in which Kat's love for Paul could translate into Paul's sobriety and upward mobility. So it's held out as a possibility. But the potential here only underscores how that future was always already foreclosed by Paul's debts, by his lack of access to capital. Um, small changes do occur um, through a duration of, um, that emphasizes the quotidian. So the novel tries to, to slow down time. Major plot events are relayed in brief while we pause over intricate descriptions of renovations. Um, when Kat sees a billboard that proclaims from homeless to Harvard, ambition, pass it on, her ever caustic uh, voice queries, couldn't they say from homeless to community college? Why do you always have to win big? So this is, you know, from homeless to Harvard, from homeless to community college. Those are two different kinds of narratives. So step forward are always accompanied in the novel by steps back, though not in any logical way. The linear temporality we see um, in the novel has no arc, ultimately ending up converging with a cyclical temporality in which Kat and Paul's juxtaposed class positions present irresolvable differences. Unlike in the 18th century, Cyclical temporality doesn't come from the fashionable world of new, of commodity consumption. Here, um, that, that, that space of consumption, um, we have 426 new television channels, but all of them are the same. There's no newness to them. Um, so in fact, financial markets are narrated too outside a cyclical or adventure temporality and just made routine. They're boring. They're tedious. Anyone um, uh, making money for cat is easy. The hard problem is capital, is being a person with equity versus not. So the novel's ending provides a brilliant version of the romance plot against the reproductive futurity of the 18th and 19th century novel, where we have inheritance, family, happily ever after. Um, this one offers an infinite regress. Um, the ending begins with a closure. At first, Kat and Paul break up, um, and he starts a relationship with the less capitalized Amber, but it undercuts that closure with a circular reading um, and brings uh, um, a completeness to its plot of capital. In the final paragraph, Amber turns out to be a nightmare, and Paul, needing money and single again, calls Kat's number. The novel breaks off with this promise of a future that will only be a repetition of the past. Um, that's where infinity lies. 
Um, such a plot refuses reproductive futurity. Family is here an em empty cliche. Its circular ending takes us back to the beginning, which significantly opens with Kat's delusion that her lover is actually trying to kill her. So the fear of death is where the narrative begins. And this existential fear includes the imperative to remember the past. When Kat tries to narrate for Paul the connection between his incarceration in jail and global capitalism, she fails because he doesn't understand what a trade union is. She realizes the problem is that the word trade union refers to things that no longer exist. So narratives that connect with the dead, with the death drive, with things that don't not, do no longer exist, not with love or social upward mobility, is what make a post-capital future possible. So um, in, in closing, to read Summer of Hate is to do the work of connecting and nesting meaning, of grappling with what doesn't fit together, of sitting with contradictions, of coming to terms with death, with the fact that individual time ends. So the death of individual death is in fact capital's ultimate temporality. Um, we see this in the enormous investments that Silicon Valley billionaires are pouring into new technologies um, to make death optional, um, as one biotech CEO uh, uh, um, claims. So, so Silicon Valley has a huge investment in, in eternal life for Silicon Valley billionaires, right? Um, but actually, the, the real sort of um, um, uh, need is to come to terms with the fact of of the narrative ending. So one of the challenges to making connections of putting the plot together in a way that opens us to these irresolvable um, um, contradictions and to the unknown that is the future and is death um, is that the division of labor and the scale of our financial interconnections are sublime and thus they resist comprehension. Capitalism granulates and fragments us into increasingly smaller and special, specialized areas of life, and that the only grand narrative offered to us today is one of, grand, of aggregation, of data analytics, where the big picture is measuring and parsing data. Um, so the surrendering of meaning, the surrendering of value um, to metrics and not to interpretation and judgment is one of the failures of contemporary culture. The future of our, our world depends upon our ability to make sense of complicated, large, complex, and often contradictory sequences, right? There is no easy black and white. There's the grays. And so if nothing else, my project is, to, is a call to reclaim the value of reading complicated literary narratives, not only for their content, but for the difficult cognitive acts that such reading trains us to make. Understanding how narr narrative works in its most complex and capacious form, that is to say in the novel, hones our sense-making skills and literally may save our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. So now we start the question session. Agora nós vamos começar a sessão de perguntas. Agradeço a Catherine. E, enfim, se alguém da, do público quiser começar perguntando, fiquem à vontade. Nós podemos traduzir as perguntas. Ou se a Júnia quiser começar. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm just thinking about so so much you have uh, so much food for thought given us. <laughs> é, Catherine trouxe para a gente muita coisa para pensar e eu estou aqui digerindo. I'm digesting, the, trying to to organize my thoughts. Uh, I've highlighted several parts and taken notes. É, destaquei várias partes e fiz anotações e estou tentando fazer aqui na né, tradução consecutivo da minha própria fala. I'm trying consecutive translation of my own oh. speech just to make things easier. Uh, it's fascinating. I don't know if anybody wants to to uh, pose questions before me. Um, 
Let me, let me just wait a few seconds. Uh, obrigada, obrigada, Luciana. Uh, so let me just go back to a few things. I, uh, I, can, I can ask you too. So, yeah, I can ask you. So my question, Catherine, is about the connection between financial crisis and the novel. Mm. Multiple novels are based on the subject or individual in this bourgeois sense. So it seems that because of this narrative frame, at the same time, the novel can show the complexity of the economic form and the novel can also mask and conceal the complexity of the economic form. Would you talk a little bit about this duplicity of the novel? Um, yeah, yeah, great question, Luciana, and, 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 and thanks for for asking it. Um, I think uh, from all that list of all those financial crisis novels that I've, I've read, you can see that that it's a popular um, uh, um, it's a popular story, right? Um, but the way that we tell it uh, matters. And so in many of these novels, there is that, that individualization of the story. And, and therefore that idea that if I did something different, I wouldn't be in debt and that I have to pay my debts. And, and so I have to do something. When in, in, in fact, um, and, and David Graeber opens his book on debt with his great example, um, is that debts do not need to be repaid. Not all of them are the same. And so um, um, we have to, Think about it differently. So the story of financial crisis, um, um, and, and every time that we have a stock market crash, people try and think, oh, we, we didn't see it coming. It's just this one-off thing. It'll never happen again. But we know that it will happen again because boom and bust financial crisis is worked into the very logic of capital. Um, it is going to happen again. It's just a question of when and a question of who is left holding um, uh, holding the the stock when it when it you know goes down, right? I think about it, I don't know if in Brazil you have that childhood game of of um, of um, the music stops and you have to sit down and there's only so many seats and one person is left out. Um, And, and it's like, that's what it's about. It's, it's, but, but it's going to happen. The music is going to stop. Um, but we have to forget that it will in order to then invest afterwards. We have to pretend it's not inevitable. Um, and that's why um, I, I argue um, that downward mobility narratives are actually part of the same system that upward mobility narratives are because they're they're conditioning us to understand financial crisis as an individual story that doesn't have um, uh, that larger context um and and so it's 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 the the ruse is that that individual could have made a better decision um, and if we all just made better decisions, we would not be in the circumstances we are. Um, and that ignores the structural problem um, uh, and the complicated interconnections of the financial um, uh, world. So so financial crisis, you know, um, in, in 2008, it was based upon bad mortgages, right, um, in, in the States. And so... And so the people who took mortgages, um, who shouldn't have got mortgages. And so it was their fault for getting into um, a mortgage crisis. Uh, when in fact, the, the banks that gave those mortgages, that took those risks, including Morgan Stanley, paid nothing. In fact, they got bailed out from the government. So the creditors didn't pay for the risks that they took, but middle class, you know, and lower class, working class people lost their jobs, lost everything. I don't know, does that answer your question? Sure, thanks so much. 
Thank you, Catherine. I think we can move on to a question from uh, the public, I guess, from the audience. Uh, Vito, do you have a question there? I, I see it, I think. Um, I do, you do, you do. Yeah. So my question is, does the anti-capitalism fight also take the novel form? Is it also non-chronological? Um, if so, uh, what would I say about that? Okay, so so I would say that um, that that the the fight against capitalism needs to take more non-chronological forms. That is to say um, that it needs to um, um, get outside a kind of linear, you know, uh, um, um, narrative in order to imagine differently, um, in order to think about time, not just as cause and effect, um, but other forms of, of, of temporality. Um, we, we tend to always talk now, um, we reduce value so, so quickly to numbers, right? And to metrics um, to prove our worth we, we show how many publications we have, we count them up, um, but, but we're not doing the kind of slow work of understanding. Um, and and so, so that's kind of what I'm arguing that we need to do more of. Um, uh, and, and so I do think that Chris Krauss is one novelist who's trying to um, uh, represent a kind of anti-capitalist um, um, temporality. Um, and, and I don't know um, who might be a Brazilian equivalent. Um, Luciana introduced me to, to Roberto Bolano, and I think that, that's, that, that he's doing similar kind of plays with time. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think for uh, the the, um, the uh, Los Detectives Salvajes, um, the Savage Detectives. I don't remember what the title in English was. Definitely plays with uh, the linearity of mm -hmm. the non -linear, linearity mm -hmm. of time uh, mm -hmm. in Bolin's, uh most known novel, I would say. Uh, it's really a fascinating talk and an, an argument. I just, I, well, I remember I, uh, when you mentioned, I haven't read the novel that you brought as an illustration at the end, and I hope to, uh, but I remember you mentioning that Cat, uh, um, she has um, a, a, a postmodern critical self-reflexivity that self-consciously uh, she tries to figure out the plot of George Bush's America. So it's something like that, if I'm not mistaken, that you that you mentioned. Uh, at the same time, uh, you also bring bring up the question of uh, her um, frustration with postmodern skepticism and fragmentation. Uh, uh, to the point of uh, doubting the usefulness, if I can use that, I don't like this word, but it's the one that occurs to me, she starts doubting the relativization of everything. So in the subjectivization of everything, like everything is subjective. So it's very interesting that you point that out. Uh, and this is something, I don't know if I, I'll, I hope to manage to, to formulate a, a proper question, but you point that out and that's brilliant. Uh, um, and at the end of your talk, which is also uh, extraordinary, you you talk about the idea of reading. Uh, I mean, reading as a way, uh, reading more complex, uh, you know, um, uh, going into uh, processes of interpretation that don't. Um, I mean, that rely on kinds of texts that are not so reduced or oversimplified and let me see if I can link the two things um, I don't know how it is possible for us to build a sense of collectivity um, 
it's really a question that strikes me and well a, a sense of collectivity uh when we are at the same time talk, uh, talking about narrative mm -hmm. so because narrative has been a contentious notion uh, especially uh, from marxian perspective and maybe i would say marxists would uh kind of uh, take issue with the idea of narrative and think of truth. Uh, okay. Well, so th this is an interesting contradiction. Uh, well, I don't, I'm not saying that there is a contradiction in your paper. What I'm saying that it, is that it's fascinating to see how you illustrate your argument with the, um, uh, the examples from the novel. I'm sorry I'm taking too long uh, mm -hmm. in this intervention. Uh, and at the same time, you raise a very important question towards the end and has to do with reading. And, and with narrative, I work with narrative myself. I've been working with the narrative uh, uh, theory to think about translation. But at the mm -hmm. same time, it's, it's a tension, it's a constant tension between the idea of narrative, well, and, uh, you know, the, the will, the hope to build uh, a collective struggle, I mean, in which people don't see them as subjects, as, you know, individuals only. And, if, you know, anyways, I hope. I'm just raising questions. <laughs> that is that is a really interesting question. Um, and you're right. On on one on the one hand, I can see that 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 tension. Uh, let me say that the reason why I turn in the end to the need for more complex, you know, reading and interpretive strategies is because I believe some narratives are better than others. Some narratives are more true than others. Some narratives, you know, figure it out and others do not. Um, and maybe that's where Dorno can come in and help us with that, with yeah. trying to figure that out too, right? Um, uh, but but um, I think what's interesting to me is that in Krauss's Summer of Hate and in contemporary culture is, is I find I myself get frustrated for instance, when students say to me, but it's all just opinion, right? It doesn't, it's all relative, it's all subjective. And, and, you know, no, it's not. <laughs> we live in a shared common world mm -hmm. in which, which certain things are true. But to say that does not mean that there is the truth. And I think, and I think, so I feel like Marxist traditional Marxism has been too dogmatic in its in its feeling that there's the truth, um, and that that kind of thinking is also behind a kind of Western imperial exploitation. Right? We know better. Um, we know the truth, um, and so so I think that what Krauss Krauss does is she takes the postmodernism self-reflexivity, I don't know everything and turns it into a humility, right? I don't know everything. I'm not going to use a third person omniscient voice of God. Um, I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. So I can only speak from where I am. Um, but that's not to say um, that, there, that, that, that the narrative that I'm putting together can't be you know, better, can't be more, more complex, can't have a truth to it um, in a way that it puts together George Bush's, George Bush Jr.'s America. Um, and, and, and I like, and I think that that's the tension we need, the tension between the self-understanding humility um, that, that questions our own, you know, sense of, of, of who we are um, and it places that, however, in a narrative that attends to the other, that attends to um, and, 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 and links to um, how we are with each other and what we owe each other, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. I don't know um, if there, there are any other questions. I, I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good question. The hard um, questions. Yeah. Do do we, Luciana? Oh, okay. We so, yeah, I have one. Well, 
So Adorno and Horkheim, in their legs of enlightenment, have this analysis of Odyssey, in, in which they say that Odyssey is very similar to the adventure novel. Right. And I see in this, in this analysis at least two of the temporal patterns that you, Catherine, show in the modern novel, mm -hmm. the rich and the psycho novel. Uh, so do you think that the, this kind of uh, these four kinds of temporal frames that you listed can be combined in one novel. What do you think about that? Yes, yes, I do, um, and and it doesn't surprise me. Yes, I think, and I and I do think that actually Bakhtin, when he thinks about different kinds of of temporality, um, goes to the Odyssey um, and goes, uh, um, yeah. Um, so. So what I'm arguing is that, in fact, um, novels contain all of four temporalities at the same time, <laughs> so that so that um, the way that they move through um, the world charts different allows all of them to exist. But what do they? But but then how they come together to emphasize and tell a certain story? is where we can see the difference. Um, and so uh, and so Robinson Crusoe uh, is, is that great adventure tale, but it also has linear time. So um, what, I, what, I, what I find super interesting about Robinson Crusoe um, is that the way that it takes his adventure, he's lost on a desert island and, and somehow turns by the end of it becomes a wealthy man um through his hard work is is how the linear time makes you think so it takes it plots the linear time on top of the adventure time and makes you think that all of his money has come from his hard work and labor when in fact all the money if you recall because i know you've read the novel is at the end it comes from his his investment in his slave uh, uh, um, plantation in Brazil. So it comes from the fact that capital has been circulating all the time while he's been on his desert island. And the nice man in Brazil who's been looking after his plantation um, keeps his money for him and just reinvests it. So it compounds. Um, so my argument is that there might have been different ways of telling that story that allowed us to see that fact, that allowed us to see that Crusoe's wealth is based upon the violence of slavery. Um, but the way that it manages its temporality is to hide that part of it. Does that, does that describe? Okay, thank you. Well, I have, uh, if I can just come up with another question. You mentioned um, uh, David Graeber's argument about the um, uh, history of money uh, as helping us understand the way uh, money's novelization uh, requires a different origin story. So this is what I can uh, take from my, read from my notes now. I mean, uh, and he, he, he comes up with the idea of creditors and debtors as replacing more or less if i if i'm if i'm not mistaken in my understanding uh creditors and debtors two categories that would replace uh workers and uh so what was the other capitalists. one capitalists capitalists yes Owners. capitalists and workers uh, so I'd like to I, to know if we could go a little uh you know more into that and, and say whether you think that, uh, in what ways does this kind of categorization or the replacement uh, potentially erases uh, class struggle? Right. Because then you have a different category. You right. have a different uh, relationship which is being established. Because if you think of cre creditors and debtors, in a way, aren't we obliterating, for instance, private, private property and also the ownership of the means of production. So maybe, I mean, what is the danger of going for this new categorization? 
so if, and if I can just add another thing to this question, and I hope I promise it's going to be the last one. Um, to what extent can we address capitalist society nowadays without going into the topic um, U.S. imperialism? <laughs> Thank you very much. And Chinese imperialism. Um, I think that uh, that China too, um, through its um, its whole program of building roads, um, is is uh, doing a similar kind of capital imperialism. Um, yes, I, mean, I think it's really important to remember labor. And you're right that when we think about creditor debtor as 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 worker capitalist is replacing that, um, what might get lost is that sense of 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 labor. Um, but I don't I I think that what is gained is um is precisely the the ability to name the 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 geopolitics of global capital um so that um that that right now um uh for instance the refugee crisis is very much an a, a capitalist crisis a financial crisis of um of those who have equity and those who don't so those who have equity get to you know live lives in the West and those without that kind of investment. So for instance, any you could immigrate to Canada if you have enough money, right? Uh, but if you're a refugee, then no. Um, so, mm -hmm. so how the global flow of capital works um, is to divide the world um, in, those, in those terms. A lot of um, a lot of the the profits that that are fueling American imperialism um, are coming not from the standard form of the capitalist in his factory. Mm -hmm. They're coming from um, financialization, from fictitious capital, from um, from that um, you know the American selling bonds that sell time, sell, you know, blah, 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 turning, turning the um, um, uh, everything into a financial instrument. And, mm -hmm. and if we can't get at that part of speculative capital, that part of economic growth, we will never, you know, do anything with climate change. Um, so, so it's, it's trying to refocus and, mm -hmm. and and find a different way of getting to the heart of the issues than uh, that traditional vision of the factory worker and the owner of the factory doesn't get at. Mm -hmm. But I but I totally agree that in that while it's a joke that Paul doesn't understand what a trade union is um, because you know, the, the unions have been, you know, so, so um, um, Crush. destroyed by neoliberal policies um, yeah. and that we, we need them now more than ever. Um, I, I think that it's, um, uh, that the way that, but those unions need to happen in Bangladesh, right? Not necessarily in Canada. Um, uh, and so global capital has its own, has a different challenge. But, but they do need, they do need trade unions in Canada too, Catherine, don't yes. they? Yes, they <laughs> There's do. There's workers Absolutely. being exploited everywhere, not only <laughs> in Bangladesh or India, but in right. Canada, yeah. in, in England. And yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. actually uh, one of the good things, if there is a good thing, um, that's come out of the pandemic um, mm -hmm. is that all, a lot of the, the workers who were laid off um, because of the pandemic, the restaurant workers, um, um, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the service industry um, uh, that now we're finding they're not coming back because mm -hmm. they're realizing that those conditions were really shitty and that, um, and that they can, find ways of living without having to work. 
Um, and my hope is that that will turn into a, you know, higher wages and, and, yes. and that the, the demand, the need for workers will Absolutely. actually translate into um, um, better working conditions. conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. So we have another question. I think it's from Vito. <laughs> um, so thank you, Catherine. So maybe I can read and then I translate the question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. A question. In Brazil, the slave system was harnessed to capitalist, profit-oriented production. Thank you. It goes on. Uh, yeah. In 19th century, writers like José de Alencar, uh, we have an unrealistic opposition between the free individual and money, which in the European novel would be entirely realistic. But here, mm -hmm. the bourgeois Mm -hmm. Notion of that same free individual are obliterated because the patri patriarchal family intervenes to arrange these things according to different values. Mm. So, um, so do you do you like do you do you like that she can comment the the, the oh, okay. Ah, so he's continuing the, the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who is the 19th century novelist? I, I didn't get the name. José de Alencar. José de Alencar. So we have a different configuration about capitalism and literary form. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure. Um, did you want to translate that or? or... Oh, okay. Uh, I think the, that he is going to finish the question. I don't know. Tem mais alguma coisa, Vitor? Okay. Bom, vou traduzir aqui. Bom, obrigada, Catherine. Uma questão. No Brasil, o sistema escravocrata é quando passo, quando foi para capitalista, né? Foi orientado para é, produção e lucro, né? Juliana, talvez eu possa até me ajudar traduzindo melhor. No século XIX, escritores como José de Alencar tiveram uma posição irrealista, é, fizeram uma oposição irrealista entre o indivíduo livre e o dinheiro. O que na, na, no, na, no romance europeu seria realista, inteiramente realista. Mas aqui, a, a noção burguesa de que esse indivíduo, quer dizer, de que essa liberdade, dessa liberdade individual foi é, modificada, né? foi deturpada, porque a família patriarcal interveio e arranjou as coisas de acordo com valores diferentes. Então, nós teríamos uma configuração diferente entre capitalismo e forma literária. So, I know why Vitor is questioning this, because we have... Robert Schwartz, he's a famous critic in Brazil, and so maybe you could uh, comment his his uh, question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so what I would, uh, you know, first thank you for the question. It's it's, it's complicated. Um, and and I have to begin by saying I, I don't know if I can answer it very well because I don't know the 19th century Brazilian novel. Um, I would suggest that um, that there might be more in common than um, um, than at first glance um, in that um, yes. The Brazilian novel is is very much going to is is embedded in slavery, but so is the European novel. I mean, Robinson Crusoe's money comes from the slave population, and that capitalism, um, and there's many who've, who've argued this um, that that is fueled by the African slave trade. Uh, and Eric Williams' famous um, book on slavery and capital um, um, was one of the first to to work that out, right? Um, And 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 I would 
also add that one of the things that capitalism is is built on, particularly in the in the in the bourgeois novel, is unpaid domestic labor of women, right? The reproductive labor and unpaid domestic and, and emotional labor um, of 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 women. And and so I don't think that you that we need to separate out those. In fact, they're all part of it. Um, to think about the way that family, inheritance, um, all of those things come to mask what is at the heart of the way capital flows. Um, and and um, and so I I I. I think there might be more in common than we might think. Does that answer the question? I'm not not sure. Am I missing something in the translation? So Vito is answering. Thank you so much, Catherine and Luciana and Junior. So we're going to finish the lecture now, and I like you, I'd like to thank you again, Catherine and Junior. Uh, so the lecture was great. I don't know if Eugenia is going to say something to... I'd like to say thank you very much yeah. to, to Luciana, Vitor, and to Catherine. It's been wonderful to take part in this dialogue. And I hope to be able to, to read more of your writing and uh, you know to uh, get more familiar with, with your thought, which is definitely a contribution to our discussions on literature, on politics and Latin America, and you know all these geopolitics that you you brought up. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. I've learned a lot <laughs> thinking yeah. about uh, about the Brazilian context and you've given me some reading to do. Um, and I and I look forward to that. So making these connections, I do think is important um, mm -hmm. um, because we are in a moment of global capital. We, we, we do need to connect across borders. So thank you. And thank you all, all to all the organizers. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.